Was that WDV playing earlier this morning? Yeah. Yeah? Do you listen to it every morning? Yes, indeed. Well, what's it like hearing that station is still on the air? A miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was born right at the beginning of the Depression, 1931. And my dad was in it from the beginning. He was a pretty good poet, and he wrote poetry, sort of country poetry. And uh, he was a featured attraction. Great, it's a great station. And still is, it's a news station. News? Yeah. Did you think it would, you said it was a miracle. Did you think it would <laughs> well, still be on air all these years later? Radio land these days, that's a miracle, I think. But it's very fixed on what it wants to get done. It doesn't step outside of that. So it's always been a news station. And we're only eight miles from the state capital, Montpelier. It's got a, quite a history. The guy that had the weekly paper started it, and my father worked for him. And as it went, he got out of the newspaper business and into the radio business and never left. And he had a great voice, great voice. And so he read his poetry on the radio, <laughs> and it's still talked about. His poetry? Yeah. Is Good that... stuff about Vermont. Yeah? Yeah. It's and, and continues to be a good radio station. And I'm very proud of it. I, I heard a story, and you can tell me if this is true or not, but at a young age, you accidentally took the radio station off the air? Several times. Several times. <laughs> <laughs> what was your dad's reaction, if you remember, to you taking it off the air? Probably I got a ass whipping. <laughs> Frequently. <laughs> but I had to know what all that stuff was. What was it like growing up in that area of of radio, being around it all the well, time? It was World War II. And it's a little town in Vermont. So the Western Union office was in the radio station and the telephone office was on the second floor. So there was the news mecca of Waterbury, Vermont. And when the telegrams came about people that were lost or dead, my father had to deliver them. And uh, that was quite a time. It really brought the war home seriously. And it, it did what it was supposed to do. It was relevant to the community in which it, uh, and the surrounding communities for three or four counties. And uh, it's never lost that feeling to it. I was gonna say, with radio, the purpose of it, public radio especially, is being a service to the public. How much of that station, seems like a lot of that, was to serve the interests and needs of the public, and, and even today, it seems like. Well, that's one of my biggest arguments, is public radio. They're a pain in the ass, and they, they and they don't play fair. They get all that money, and we have to work for a bit of it, which are sponsors and underwriting programming that means something to people. And I guess they can say the same thing, but I look at it from someone who is a capitalist. <laughs> bugs me. <laughs> you know, you said you wrote programming for the interests of people. Was that kind of ingrained in you at a young age of, you know, <laughs> needing to needing to produce something that would be interesting for people to want to listen to and tune in? Well, it was a cow station. It was a country station. And uh, my grandparents were farmers and they lived about 45 miles away from Waterbury. They listened all the time, <laughs> so they were good critics. But it's a challenge every year to see how we're going to continue to operate that thing. And I love that station. I love radio. Growing up here 
as a youngster in Vermont, you know, you're you're working in and around the radio station, going to school. Were you, were you a good student? No. No? <laughs> there were too many things to do. So I was not the best student. But uh, it all worked out. Where did you apply your time the most? Various activities and various things. We used to cover the country fairs. Boy, I lived for the autumn. <laughs> and there would be six or seven fairs, and they'd go there and sit up for three or four days and review the winners in all the dairy and sheep and chickens and rabbits. And uh, that was important stuff to people that live in Vermont, along with the news that Vermont continued to create out of Montpelier and out of Washington. We always sent pretty good people down to Washington. Not all the time, but most of the time. And that was a part of it. And it has never lost that part of the station. But it's a worry because anybody with a popular format of music is a competitor and usually a strong one. And uh, so far we're there, <laughs> here, now. <laughs> Still around, yeah. Yeah. The fairs that you were talking about, what 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 kind of events would go on there? Well, the big thing in the 30s, end of the 40s, and through the war, the, the war period, were the harness races. The Kentucky Derby meant nothing, but there was another race that meant everything. We had two winners driven by a, a Waterbury man, and that was news. Yeah, but that was what people were interested in and what they knew about and what they cared about. And that, that should make up what a radio market is. It gets lost these days with this plethora of different music formats that are meaningless. Mm -hmm. So in that case, public radio, my arch enemy, <laughs> uh, they serve a purpose and they do a good job. Just hard to admit it. <laughs> what would be your definition then of good radio? Well, what the FCC said that we should do is serve the people and be responsible for what you had on the air. It's challenging to do and it's very expensive to do it's a lot easier to hire some blockhead with a group of 45 records to go in and slot them in and it's gone but you have to work to get the news and uh we're still doing it, <laughs> it started in 1931 right when the depression started <laughs> wdev started yeah i think this is my first time in vermont and I remember driving in yesterday and just seeing all the trees and it was beautiful. What, what's it like growing up here and still being here today? What keeps you here? Well, I'm still here <laughs> and I love it. I mean, this, this to me is home and this piece of property we're on, my dad bought, he didn't have a penny in the anything <laughs> and, uh, but he put enough together and married my mother. And This house that I built here is on about seven acres that he bought just outside of Waterbury, Vermont. And he looked all over during World War II because you couldn't have any money for gas and stuff. That didn't exist. And they walked all these mountains around here looking for the place to build. And the war ended. <laughs> and my mother said, Lloyd, do you remember where we used to go parking? <laughs> and he said, you, you mean up on the hill? And she said, yeah, right there around the corner. She said, we ought to go up and look there. And that's this place. And that's right here. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What was, what was the house household dynamic like growing up? Well, it was a tough time in the war. And my father was very fortunate. And pulled it off and did it well. As I say, the old squire was a known Vermont poet, mm -hmm. and uh, we leaned on that pretty hard. 
and on the whole idea of you had to serve the public. And if you didn't, nothing doing. It's a hard thing to keep track of these days. Hard thing to keep track of, yeah. Your dad was a poet and, you know, with poetry, it, it takes a, a good understanding of words and, and you need a, a, a high vocabulary. Is that where you think you, you got your first you know, idea of this is how I'm supposed to write in a certain way and um, kind of where you developed your own vocabulary? I'm not really sure of that. I had some good grandparents. I had a grandmother that was big on reading and kept track of everything. Hmm. Never got away from that, nor her, nor my, my father's mother. But she was a town girl, and that was a different life, too. But we had the two of them. And if you had to have a background, I was blessed. And I had the liberty of trying some other things that many couldn't do. And one of them was in going to those country fairs that we did every fall, the big fairs, Rutland and Champlain Valley, those fairs would have one day of racing on the weekend. When I discovered that, it was history. <laughs> I couldn't get over it. It was so great. I haven't got over it yet. <laughs> Some of the greatest races I ever saw were on a half mile dirt track. You can't beat it. What was your first, do you remember your first memory of seeing those cars go around the track? Yeah, but it's sort of a, cloudy cluster of events because the fairs would buy a day of racing from a, a promoter and they'd bring two stars of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway <laughs> to your track out there attempting to establish new records in open cockpit, bobtailed streamliners. Whew. <laughs> And I can still see them, and they they were great then, and they're great now. The stars of Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Do you remember some of the names that, that came by? Not then. Yeah. Well, I well, give me a second, and I can. You don't you don't have a half an hour for me to toy around in my mind with <laughs> what they were, but but uh, a lot from Pennsylvania come up to Vermont, and they did bring some good drivers up here that we got to see. Ted Horn, and it, it was a fun time. And they were serious racers. And they were part of a circuit and they were making their money on running those cars. And those tracks, which were horse race tracks, were exceedingly dangerous. And uh, the announcers, of which one of the greatest, and probably where I got one of my biggest pushed into the track business was Chris Economaki. And he worked for a guy that promoted the Trenton Motor Speedway, the Indianapolis of the East, if you will. <laughs> and it was great stuff. And I never, never got over it. Still haven't. <laughs> well, what did you learn from Chris Economaki over the, over the years? The importance of ex exaggeration. Okay. We were selling a product and that was these cars and these drivers. And Chris, I, in my mind, will always be the best. And there were a lot of good announcers. Arish Horan was around then. I don't want to get into that because there are a whole group of them. Mm -hmm. But Chris Economaki, in my mind, set the table. And so much of what I have done over my life is based on how he presented the races. And he presented them so that people that didn't give a fig about them would go to the race and think they saw something special. And they did. Those guys drove their hearts out. It was a good time to be growing up, even though it was in the war. How do you make someone who goes to the track know that they're witnessing something unique that night? every single night, as you mentioned. Well, exaggeration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. 
But isn't that so much of what our life is and what we think we see when we watch television and motion pictures and so forth? But there they were, right there, on the track, right in front of you, going like hell. And uh, Economaki would take incredible sights. I'll give you a story. This, is, this actually happened at the uh, Essex Junction Fairgrounds. And that was a very beautiful half mile track. And a lot of records for the trotters and pacers were set on that track. But one day a year, in came the open cockpit cars. Mm -hmm. And it was magic. One day, this car went sailing down into turn three and it spun around and stopped. And that was all the Conomac he needed. Oh, turn three, <laughs> faithfully staying with that car as he lost control. Ladies and gentlemen, we we'll try to be back this afternoon to continue racing. Whoa, that was a story. I mean, and we actually saw it and it was real. It wasn't a movie, it wasn't a book, it was there. And those guys were great. And this one day, the Essex Junction Fair down near Burlington had this one day. And then the, car, the whole fair people would move down to Rutland, Vermont, the southern part of the state, set up and do the same thing for the following week. But this one day, everybody had left Essex Junction, except that the print cars were around to run a race on Sunday on the fairgrounds track. And uh, this one gentleman drove down in the corner and spun around and went through the fence. And Economaki was in heaven. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, somewhere from somewhere in Pennsylvania, so-and-so miraculously is climbing out that automobile after you just saw him out of control but he is all right, and he may be back this afternoon to continue the program. <laughs> Whoa, I thought he was superb. And this one day, this guy that spun around, when Chris got on a roll and was really getting excitement out of the audience, he would develop that story about this guy and so mm -hmm. forth, and carried on about him. and. He asked to have the fire truck and the ambulance immediately reported to turn three. You can imagine in the exaggeration, the fear and trembling that went through the grandstand. As he continued it, he overdid it, which he often did. <laughs> and all of a sudden, from the time that the guy spun around and was getting out of the car and trying to get everything together to get it picked up and put back and see if they could get it started, he continued to wax on about this and about this guy. And he's looking out over the track and over the crowd. And he sees in the little flower garden below the start finish line, a woman fainted. And he couldn't let go. He says, imagine watching your husband going into turn three and spinning around on your track and trying to come back now. What a story this is, right? And he'd build on the story. All of a sudden, up came the uh, woman who said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I am Mrs. Ted Brown or whatever it was. And he looked over and said, oh, I beg your pardon, who was that? And the farmer that ran the program at the track said, there was a lady, that lady had a cow over off the third turn that didn't go to Rutland to the next fair. It still was staked out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was worried about the cow. <laughs> and he said, oh, I beg your pardon. And, so forth, and on we went with the show. But that was the golden days of, of racing as it grew up, based on a lot of exaggeration, which there is and always will be in racing.
but also on the fact that people were serious enough at that time to go out and do those kind of things. We didn't see that in many places. And shortly thereafter, through all of Vermont, there were 10 trace tracks, dirt tracks. Farmers would take a field that wasn't doing well, didn't have any crops in it, and they would build a racetrack. Hmm. And they all needed announcers. Well, I had heard from the very best, the authority, Chris Economaki, and I could imitate him to the, to the nines, the beginning of my career. It all started there. <laughs> Certainly did. So you mentioned Chris, Chris Economaki being able to sell these races like none other, and you got a chance to see him do it and hear him do it. Was that kind of what sold you into into this profession? Well, no, I love the races, but he had the formula, and he was so good at it. So I learned a lot, and pretty soon he would start it, and he had enough going on. He was quite a bit, and still is, in my mind, one of the great businessmen of racing. Uh, would go on to the next. And they'd leave the end of the show for me to finish. <laughs> we finally got caught one year when somebody went down in the turn one and dumped a sprint car and it went off into the midway. And it was a crisis. And the fair director came rushing up and said, where's Chris? Well, he's not here. What do you mean he's not here? The race is still on. Well, he's on his way to Bayonne or wherever. Oh, that was tough. But that actually happened. But I was far enough along that he felt I could finish the show and say thank you and good night and uh, do it in his style or Irish or Anne or whoever. So that put a lot of responsibility on me and I was ready for it. And from the very beginning, I thought, you know what we need is we don't have a paved track in Vermont that is exemplary of where racing is at this time. We have a lot of dirt tracks and we had a lot of dirt tracks that farmers would put together and the boys would come out on the weekend and race stock cars, jalopies, whatever you think. So we put together a deal and started Thunder Road and I tried to bring up this vision of what racing was all about. Well, we succeeded, I guess, still there, and they still race, and they race like the Dickens. And I feel pretty good about that. So there's, there's only dirt tracks in the area. You have the need to, to make a paved racetrack, and that's where Thunder Road comes from. And you said it was still here today. How old are you at this time when you're I building in, Thunder I, Road? I was in high school. Still in high school? Yeah. It, was that a big task to put this paved racetrack together? Well, you bet it was. <laughs> but I soldiered on, and we got it done. And another track up in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, Thunder Road, is in the granite capital of the world, Barrie, Vermont. <laughs> now, nobody knows that, but you do now, because they have a great granite seam that went for 30 or 40 miles. Uh, and uh, so most of the stones that were cut were, came from Vermont. Where'd you get the name Thunder Road from? Stole it. From who? <laughs> the movie. Okay. <laughs> Robert Mitchum. Yeah. Who wrote it, produced it, starred in it. <laughs> right? Have you ever seen it? I have not, but I've, I've heard of You've it. You've got to go look at it. Okay. Because it's a great, and it's about the Southeast, but it, it plays to what the stock car part of it was. And the name just seemed to me to be synonymous with what we were doing. For our people in Vermont, they had a Thunder Road. It was, and still is, very nice race, racetrack. What kind of things would you do to promote Thunder Road and promote the racing around here? 
we're in every week on Thursday night because the because the workers got paid on Thursday. The people that were down there bringing up the stones that would be carved into suitable monuments to people, and they loved it. And they would come and bring their families and sit on the banks and watch these cars. And they developed their own heroes. And Barry, Vermont had its own group of race drivers that were, as far as Barry, Vermont was concerned, were as good as anything at Indianapolis. <laughs> that was fun. So before they people got a chance to spend their fresh paycheck on a grocery store and anything like that, they would go to Thursday Night Racing at Thunder yeah, Road? Certainly. <laughs> well, you could go to Thunder Road on Thursday night. You could do your grocery shopping on Friday night, do what you would do on Saturday night, and be all set for Sunday. It sounds and like we, a good weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect weekend. <laughs> and sometimes we had have special events on Sunday. But that was the history of Thunder Road. And still is. <laughs> still runs on Thursday night. So you're 25 when Thunder Road opened. You said it took a long time to get it built. What was it like finding investors to, you know, put their money in Oh, there's Road? always people that are interested. Yeah. <laughs> Interest and then putting money down is a serious situation. Yeah. But we had some good that understood what we were up to. And Barry, Vermont was... We couldn't have found a better place to start that racetrack because they that that's an Italian town in the middle of Vermont because those really good workers on stone all came from Italy. So we had a bunch of drivers that related to them and they were good. And with enough time and enough experience, I guess so they could handle cars pretty well. <laughs> and we would have a Dickens of a time. Yeah. I spoke with uh, Dave Moody, who learned a lot from you and grew up around this area and around Thunder Road. I actually have a clip of him describing uh, the wall at Thunder Road. Here, I'll, I'll give it to you to play. This is Dave Moody talking about Thunder Road. This is great. <laughs> um. The, wall, uh, the outside wall starts in turn four. Well, now it goes all the way around the track, but back in the day, it started in turn four and ran all the way to turn one. And rather than being, you know, perpendicular to the racetrack, it actually tipped back a little bit. So they'd come off turn four, and if you got a little offline, like six inches offline, you'd go up on the wall, and you'd either go all the way over, or you come back down again and sometimes keep right on going without ever losing a spot. There were there were seasons where we averaged about one and a half rollovers per night. Do you remember that? <laughs> was that a problem? Well, I think that's an exaggeration <laughs> by him. But he was always that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, he learned well then about the exaggeration and part he, of it. he lived right near the track. And he loved it and still does. Yeah, it represents so much of what we were and what we have become because racing was a rural activity. All those indie stars that were so great in the 30s, we think about, there's always some celebrity, but they were basically people that worked the farms and worked the lawn, and they would get enough money together and build cars. Guess where it came next? Where'd you go? Southeast. And same thing. And they came back from World War II, and they weren't going to sit around and play tennis or baseball. They wanted something with some teeth in it. And stock car racing was it. And that's how they built so many of the great tracks in the Southeast, Boom and Gray, mm -hmm. everywhere you look down there. And now some of those names are coming back uh, we're seeing one being developed that was one of the early tracks in the South. I think that's terrific. Yeah, it's great to see the, the roots of racing still around today. You know, Thunder Road is still around. Um, what was, I mean, because you mentioned people came back from the war and didn't want 
baseball or, or other sports and there was some gravitation to racing. Was that the case before the war as well? Or was it something that happened after people came back? Well, I can't tell you because I was too young to really understand. But I, I think you're onto something there, that they, they realized there was something more than catching the ball and throwing it somewhere. That these guys, you know, part of it was that brave enough to die thing. Mm -hmm which fit absolutely in with all those kids coming home yeah. from the Pacific and from Europe. And they weren't gonna fool around or fuss with anything that didn't have some teeth in it. And racing was it. And they could build their own cars and do it inexpensively and race them. And, and so we would build, and most of these tracks did. And you still see it today all over the country, those little tracks, quarter mile, third mile, half mile, it's kind of going fast on the half mile, where those people got their talent, went to college, if you will, on the dirt, and some of them progressed and progressed and came up to being what Lee Petty was in 57, 58. Racing is full of daredevils, like you said, brave enough to die. I mean, it seems like it would be somewhat easy to make heroes out of drivers who are willing to put their life on the line. What was it like branding and, and making some of the heroes, especially locally here at Thunder Road? Well, that was our job. Yeah. And, and working on stories about these people, which could be your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And because of their place on the picking order, in the community weren't recognized for too much, but boy, could they drive a car. <laughs> and you put them together and start 20 of them, and you've got a show. Did you ever race yourself? Yeah, badly. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't go well? I loved it. Yeah? But I was too expensive for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's such a good game and such good people. And most of my friends today, the serious friends that go deeply into my background, came out of racing in Vermont. They're dying off, as we all do. But they created a whole new atmosphere that people hadn't thought about because it didn't exist. And they'd run the britches off those cars. And when they raced, they raced as if it was really serious. And they didn't have anything hitched to it that wasn't serious. And kids loved it. Mm. Well, because kids love race cars. Yeah. What did your parents think of you racing? They were ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew shortly that I had something better that I could do, which is talk. I could blab <laughs> and make these guys that ran at our racetrack, Hard Luck Hannaford, the Ingerson brothers, those kind of people, really important. Ingerson brothers were lumberjacks over in New Hampshire. They were the regular working people that had found something they could do and they could add it into the other things that were being done by others and done for them. Barry represented so much of that. And so many of those people, as I look back, that was a high point in their lives because they could do it. And they got cagey enough, smart enough, build cars that were durable to stand the gaff and win races. Same thing happened in the Southeast, certainly happened out West. That's sort of the history of stock car racing. I think it goes back to about the time that Daytona got built. And heretofore, that was something that other people did. But when they built Daytona, Bill France and company, there was an opportunity to have this two and a half mile track 
where they could really go, take the risk if they did, and make it meaningful. Changed everything. And we're seeing it today. We're into a new generation of it. And they are so different today than even 20 years ago. These kids that have come up now and have the ability to learn how to drive by hook or by crook, by using things that we know nothing about. And they're putting on tremendous races. That couldn't have happened back then. So it's all part of the growth and the changing of the way. But it makes it more important ever to me that they're there and they're doing it. It's amazing to see how technical racing is today. <laughs> it comes down to hundredths of an inch in terms of shaping a body and everything. We've learned so much about racing. Well, we learned how to cheat too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that? Is, is cheating cheating or is it? No, no, no. I mean, they have to catch them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and that's the same thing as baseball or football <laughs> or tennis or anything you want to say. But it's, it's got some vitality to it that the others, in my mind, don't have and demand so much that nobody knows about. These families that build cars that would run at the nation's site of excitement, Thunder Road, huh? that's a great challenge. Putting that car together, making it stay together, and make it consistently victorious. That's the best story of America there is. Some of that gets lost, but not all. And then the higher level of that is what we see at Daytona and what NASCAR continues to represent. I think that's terrific. We love stories of creativity, as we call it, not cheating. Yeah. Um, were there any good ones <laughs> of, of people pushing the boundaries at Thunder Road or some of these local tracks that you remember? Nearly every way. <laughs> what, was, what are some examples? Somebody would, would, well, they would come up with different ideas about how to get around the track. <laughs> That's theirs, not mine. We'll leave that subject alone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it alone. There are a, a plethora of, of different ways to yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Daytona coming about in a two and a half mile track in, in Daytona Beach, Florida. Was that ever heard of or anything like that before? Well, then? there are some big tracks. Yeah. No question about it. But that, for a lot of time, represented the money trash that had the money to build sports cars and that kind of thing. But when you got down to the meat and potatoes that were grown off that land, that was where Bill France just had this incredible sense of what America was really about. And he presented to them what they really were. And it was certainly not the intellectual top of the order, but it was the people of this country all over, all those short tracks. And every one of them had a champion and a villain. And they were all home cooked. They were there. They were theirs. And you could play Little League Baseball. You could play any sport. But here was something that really represented what America was because of the automobile. Right, yeah. And that 1958 race, and Bill France was such a genius and gets not any near the credit he deserves. He knew that. He came from up around Washington, D.C., and was headed to Florida, stopped off in Daytona Beach, ended up with a filling station down there. And he built this entire thing penniless when he started. It's just the most incredible story. And, and it's all encapsulated in that first Daytona 500. Well, you got down to the end of it. And there was Johnny Bochamp from the Midwest. He was a real deal. They announced that he was the winner. Wait a minute. 
There are some, the conjecture in that someone else has won this race. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna hold and not announce the winner until we're certain of it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and they got pictures from every direction and Lee Petty won it. And he did win it. Yeah. But there were three cars side by side, flat out coming to the line. One, nobody thought any of them would last that long, <laughs> that there was a very good chance that the Daytona 500, that it would be the Daytona race minus X <laughs> amount of cars. Yeah. And they drove them so well, and they were aware that they were really on call here to be good. Nobody would have believed that that race would finish that way. And so Bill hold, uh, held up everything. And they found that photo of the, because they didn't have a, well, why would you need a photo finish? And uh, there it was. And that was the best we had. Yeah. And Lee got credit and Beauchamp got second. Yeah. And another car was up on the outside two laps there. That we could register with. And they were late model cars now, new cars. Whoa. All of that played into this sport evolving into what we have today. It's all found in that picture. Yeah, I find it unbelievable that after 500 miles, it comes down to a matter of feet, inches. And it still does. It still does. It still does. Yeah. And the thing is now these kids today are so good. They're so well-trained. They have the wherewithal and the desire to go out and learn how to make this stuff work. And it works. It does. And, and the sport worked in general. You mentioned Bill France Sr. penniless with a, with a dream to start NASCAR. What do you remember in conversations with him about his early visions for what he wanted the sport to be? You see them. Yeah. I mean, he created what he thought he saw. And he, and he captured the imagination of the public. Many people don't give him any near the uh, value that he was, still is, because those cars running together that well, that long, over an established distance, history. And this guy, this great big guy, who had a good fence about people and hired people that were so good. The minute he found somebody he liked and thought could add and contribute to bringing this level of racing up, they were on the team. He was quite a man. How did you first get connected with him? There was a guy named Dob Saul, S-A-L-L. -L. He was a sprint car driver. And he ran in the 30s and he was pretty good. And he had the gift of gab, and France heard about him, and he made him the Northeast representative for NASCAR. And God knows that the sport had grown in so many directions. Every part of the country needed another fellow. And if you check on it, you'll find them from California to New England. And uh, I got recommended by Bob Saul. <laughs> and I went down for two days. What was it, 58, 57 in there? And uh, here I am to now. <laughs> and proud of it. Yeah. And the people that were at Daytona fighting and scratching and trying to make it go and make it work for themselves are the same people as today. They really work at it. They really care about it and they care so much, nobody gets that. I mean, now because there's so much factory and that's all right, but that desperate feeling that they had when we evolved from where we were, it's a, it's a testimony to Bill France. He not only understood it, but he took it and he made America take right. heed. Yeah, and, right. and that's kind of what I'm interested in because he sold you on his dream 
but you had to sell the dream to people on the more national level at, at CBS. And it, it took a while to get it on television and, and get it to become where it is today. How difficult was that battle of trying to sell NASCAR to other people who didn't quite understand it quite like you or Bill France did? I don't know that I could really explain that, but but it was there. It was in the air. And because that it evolved with the motor car and so much of our society is based upon what kind of a car you have and the character of the people that were involved. And France worked so hard to put that stuff together, made it work. And when he got it all combined, then he went out and built another track at Talladega. <laughs> and then and NASCAR grew because it was a it was like a baseball semi professional thing. But these guys meant it. They I mean they, they were so intent and they cared so much. They carried the weight for Bill. What did broadcasting NASCAR look like before the first flag to flag race or in those in the 70s the years of um kind of building it up to that 1979 500 go back and look at the end of the depression and those guys running those cars on little tracks indoors mm -hmm. in chicago all over the country and that sense of trying to be successful at something that was risky real risky and being able to do it that was the united states of america no question about it never did they talk about that with france but he he understood it and he worked so hard for so long made a lot of mistakes <laughs> but we all do i spoke with uh david hobbs a few weeks ago um you guys have been through a lot together. He says he remembers going to New York City or, you know, a different different city around the country at 1 a.m. to record pre-recorded races, voiceovers. Do you remember doing that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> was that difficult? No, no. Really? No, because something was going to happen with them. Yeah. And people would get to see it. And that, I think, as much as anything, drove it hard because the American public needed something more than baseball. How long were those pre-recorded broadcasts? Were they were, were they full races? Some were, some were. Some were. Yeah. Yeah. And there were other networks and that that it festered down here in the southeast because they had this made for them uh business about the bootleggers, they were a part of American history. And because that it gets back to agricultural results, that's where they made the whiskey. That's where they took the money that they made with that and built race cars. <laughs> it wasn't like in the city and nobody understood that there was a commonality here. But those people that did that and believed in it so much that we remember some of them for their past final performances. Very serious stuff. And they were so serious, all of them. And today they are too. The kids today are just as serious. And they have to equate what they're doing with what they want. And they all want more and they're willing to take whatever risk is necessary to get there. That's the American way. Yeah. That's how we won in Europe and in, over Japan in World War II. It was that feeling. And when all those kids came home, whoa, <laughs> you had another whole batch of racers. And those people, when you think back on it, aren't any different from anybody else except that they had been tested in warfare 
they brought it home and they brought that sense of feeling for something they cared so much about to risk it all, to jump up out of the foxhole and run along and maybe make it and maybe not. Mm -hmm. That's what stock car racing is all about. There's a quote from a reporter um, for ESPN, Marty Smith, and uh, he says that passion is undefeated. And I think you can apply that to anything, you know, it, 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 especially it, as you mentioned, these guys coming back passionate about the racing. It's no different than the drivers we see today. How would you describe that passion back then? It's just their sense of something they can do. The Wood Brothers, so good at developing cars, what were called stock cars then. When they ran that race, the Daytona 500, and had those three cars come across the line together, that was a turning point because the American public got caught, right? And slapped in to look at this thing again because Lee Petty was as tough a race driver as there was, but there was something about him. And oh yes, there was another Petty coming along that was really important. They cared that much. And Richard Petty, all of his life has been only that. One of the great, great lines was after, I can't think which accident it was. I think it was at Daytona. Mrs. Petty said, you need to retire. And he, who greatly respected his wife said, when it's time, I'll come, I'll finish up. So now he goes back and he keeps racing and he's so good. And he's so good with people because he understood those people that came up and stood in the lane and waited to get his autograph that cared about him. And he kind of has always been that way, that he felt for the American public that cared about this, that he should give something more. In fact, he even took time out to make a new autograph for himself that would give him an extra two or three seconds to spend with a person when they walked up so he could look him in the eyes. Wow. I mean, that's so crazy. But that's what he believed. They were willing to invest their nickel in what he believed in. And he could do at least that for them. He, he's a great story. So I think it was Darlington where he really got smacked up and he got crashed a lot. And Linda Petty went in to see him still at the track, and it might have been Daytona, I can't remember which track. And he had said, I'm going to do this until it isn't fun anymore. <laughs> and she goes in and he's laying here on his cot and they've put uh, cotton swabs over his eyes so that he didn't get hurt by the sunlight. And they are gonna take him out and down to the hospital. And she really loved him and cared about what he cared about. And she looked down at this mountain of a guy and said, well, are we still having fun? <laughs> huh? Doesn't that sound like Mrs. Somebody? Yeah. You mentioned the petties. And I think we were, when we were, before we hit record, you were telling me a little bit about Richard Petty. What do you remember about young Richard Petty walking around in the NASCAR garages? Yes, no, and ask my daddy. <laughs> that was Richard, who had great respect for his kinfolk, and he had great respect for the business of racing. And he demonstrated that all of his life, and still does. I mean, he doesn't stop. He's there with a purpose. And he's certainly one of the greatest ambassadors that racing has ever had because of what his family has given. And he doesn't have any problem with that. Mm -hmm. He hurts as much as anyone hurts when they lose somebody in their family. But he understands that if you do that, 
the result may be this. And it's still worth doing. It's a great thing for the United States. <laughs> I mean, if you could get that sense into most people that whatever they did was worth something more. Richard Petty is one of my heroes, and for that reason. Did you think anyone else would join him in the category of seven championships? Well, you undeniably, Earnhardt. And that's another family, racing family. Right, yeah. And he was what they were, and so good at it. And as he grew and developed and learned more about society, he changed and became even more aware. And uh, that was a heartbreaking loss. I want to jump back to, I think it was 1964, Walter Cronkite called a NASCAR race. I didn't know that. <laughs> Not many do. <laughs> Bill wasn't very happy because it was the Daytona 500, which was his stage for what he believed in. And they went down there and did that race. And it was very evident that he did know about racing, cell belt racing, sailboats were what he knew about. And he didn't really fit in with what was being defined as a sport. That settled a little hard. And it was one of the reasons he became more intrigued about build, building stuff that the American public could accept, understand, and take part in. I have always given him such credit for making mistakes, realizing it, and going in a new direction. Motor Racing Network was going out of, there were several networks, radio networks, uh, in the earlier days. But he felt that A, he needed great radio time and he realized that the Sunday ministers were getting two or three hours. He could have that time too. <laughs> and he could sell people on what his ideas were about that. And he did. A lot of people think that the first flag to flag coverage of a NASCAR race was the 1979 Daytona 500, but that wasn't the case. It was the 1971 Greenville 200, and you were a pit reporter on that. Yeah. Do you remember that broadcast? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> I had something that looked like a, a pack from World War I <laughs> lugged around, and, uh, and I had a great time. David Pearson and Bobby Isaac were the stars in that show. Imagine a guy who came out of that business of making underwear in North Carolina. The star, right, with Bobby Isaac, who I just loved. He couldn't read too well, but he could understand as well as anybody I ever met in my life. I thought he was quite a guy. And that was good enough for him. And he thought he could do it better, and he kept proving it. And that race, uh, those two fought it out at the end. It was a runaway, I think. Didn't Bobby Isaac beat David Pearson by I a few laps? I think he did, uh, yeah. be because one of them tuckered out, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the car tuckered out, yeah. not him. But those are the guys that, that really put solid roots in the ground for this sport and where it's going and what it's becoming and more power to them. I heard you describe the 71 flag to flag race in Greenville is quite the experiment. What worked about it, what didn't work about it, and you know, what did ABC think about, about that race after it was all said and done? I can't tell you that. I know that I walked out and thought, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And it was a short track, it wasn't a long track. And they did the same thing they did everywhere they go and still do today put every ounce of effort they have into winning. 
no equivocation about it. This is worth doing. Not many people today can put up with that. Yeah. But they do. And these kids today, most of whom I don't know, I see these new names and I, what the heck is going on here? We've got this avalanche of new names. But where are the Isaacs, the Kaylee Arboros? You know, Kaylee Arboro, who used to jump out of airplanes. <laughs> and he had a parachute in a lard can, and that was the, for a fair. And he'd come down and open it on the way down. Huh? Crazy. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, well, go talk to him about it. <laughs> <laughs> Daredevils. Yeah. And they were. And there was no question about it. And Hale was one of the ones that you could be sure his intention was to use whatever he did to make it work. So you mentioned Cale Yarborough jumping out of an airplane and these guys being daredevils as race car drivers. Was a car another thing Cale could do? Was it something that fit his personality already? Ask, ask him. Yeah. But I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, to put together or to work with people that could put together a car that could run 300, 400, 500 miles and still be at the end. Hey, and that originally was not out of Detroit. That was right out of the barnyard over and over again in the South. And they were so proud of it. That was their people doing what they do well. Nobody paid attention to the Northeast, you know, because we got all those fancy colleges and all that. But underneath all of that were people that cared just as much about proving that they could do something that others couldn't. That, that's, that's a big part of it right there. And they could and, <laughs> and made some money at it. What's wrong with that? Yeah, it comes down to the, you know, your, your famous quote, it's, it's common men doing uncommon, uncommon deeds. Uncommon deeds. Yeah. Which was all of World War II. Common man doing uncommon deeds are, is why we were so successful in the Pacific and punching into Germany in World War II, too. They, they, they wouldn't be denied. They'd stick with it and fight with it as long as they had breath to breathe. On the plane ride here, um, per your daughter Ashley's suggestion, I watched the movie Rush, um, which was about the you know 1976 Formula One championship with James Hunt, Nicky Lauda. I heard you were all around that season and, and even went to Japan for that championship race. I did. <laughs> Yeah, I stole him out of the <laughs> press conference because we had to get it on CBS. I wasn't a very good person. <laughs> <laughs> but it was CBS News, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, that's what we said it was. <laughs> <laughs> so why'd you say it that way? Well, because we weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> and we developed the theory about why we could be there because it was news. And my God, it was. <laughs> and we didn't use that much, two or three minutes, but enough to tell the story. But you have to be on your toes and working on making sure you get it, whatever the job is, done and done right. And I love CBS for that. Yeah. And I always will. Because they had such a determination to do things better with everything they did. And when they bit into sports, they did it. And they had people and producers and directors that were so talented. And I was just lucky to come along at the time when they decided, oh, we need to look at that and that. Well, we'll try that. And they put a team together for Daytona. It was unbelievable all the way. The audio guy, all of them, producers, directors, and... Uh, that's what America is supposed to be about. It gets lost. But it doesn't get lost at Thunder Road. By God, when that guy crosses the finish line, you know he's done the job that day. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned CBS 
wanted to do things right. And that was something that David Hobbs mentioned to me when I chatted with him about the 1979 Daytona 500. And, you know, you go from 71 flag to flag coverage with ABC and the wait, it seems like is over. You're going to get a flag to flag race of the Daytona 500 on CBS. You mentioned the, the crew that was brought along with it. What do you remember about leading up to that February to, to get set for the 79 Daytona 500? Well, we had a job and it was a good job and it was worth doing, not just because we were employed, but because it meant something to so many that had not been particularly represented, although baseball did, but as far as I was concerned, that didn't count. I had to have something more, more corn on the cob. And that's what racing was. What do you remember about the 79 race itself? It comes down to the two drivers getting into it. There's a fight, you know, between your famous call. What do you remember about, you know, that call? That we had a helicopter up. Okay. Because the, the feed went through the helicopter and then into the truck. That's how we did it. We had one helicopter to take care of the in-car stuff. And, uh, and that's exactly what we had seen in Australia and come back and said, we've got to do this and we've got to do it quick because economy was there at the same time in Australia. I don't know why he was there, but he was. And I said, well, you can't f around. We got to get this done. And we've got to own it, that in-car camera, because this is going to change everything. They bought it. We got it done. With the in-car camera, I remember reading articles saying that the original versions were really heavy, boxy, maybe 50 pounds. dangerous, right? 50 pounds. Yeah, if they told, <laughs> turned over and then the thing would kill them. Oh my gosh. So how did you get them in the cars? <laughs> on their faith in my good word. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed to be enough. <laughs> yeah, it got by that time wasn't for long because that, when you look at those cameras and the way they were set up in there, geez, the problem that we had before that was, what did it mean? Nobody knew, uh, they couldn't understand why that was so important. Car running around in circles. Mm -hmm. You put the camera in there and they'd pull up and something would come by them or they would go by them. And it changed the whole attitude about the driver. Before, it was just some bozo from South Carolina driving around in circles. Now, the opportunity was there for the viewer to see what the hell they were going through. Yeah. And the best part of that story is the uh, <laughs> so yeah, who was that? Who's that doing that? That was the mystery of the year at so, Daytona. So tell me this. Tell me that story. We had the best sound guy in the business that worked for CBS, and he he had done everything for them. And he said, "I've got a problem." He says, "We pick up a harmonic out of <laughs> Kale's car, and we can't get rid of the fucking thing. You got to help us with it because." We don't know what to do. So they <laughs> fussed and fooled around for a while, and they couldn't fix it. He'd get up in the banks, and this would be in practice toward the race. And all of a sudden, ah, <laughs> you know, and it'd go on for <laughs> eight or nine seconds and then stop. And then it'd start again. And finally, <laughs> finally, after a while, the audio guy said, I think I got it. <laughs> it's not the car. It's not our equipment. It's Kale. Yep. <laughs> and it was. He'd get up on the wheel, and he had his hands, and he used one hand on the left side. And when he, uh, and then it'd go away. <laughs> and we discovered that our problem was that we had to get a new driver in there or else <laughs> muffle him because he couldn't hear it. 
Why did he do it? Subconscious thing that he didn't even know he did. He had no idea. He had no a, idea. I don't think he that? had an idea in the world that he did that. Kill Yarbrough making race car noises in 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 the turns. It wasn't meant to be a noise. It was, it was just, just like his, a humming. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. And it was at a, a strange harmonic, and nobody thought of it as a human voice at the time. <laughs> as good as their audio was, they couldn't control the kale. <laughs> Don't want to hear it? Turn it down. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Not many people can control Kelly Armbrough, maybe. <laughs> nobody could. Nobody could. And Remember he used to fly with that, that bear? He got, they finally took him out of the air because he had that little plane. And Susie the bear would end up in Atlanta or somewhere with him in the cockpit flying the, <laughs> with the bear sitting beside him. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Jesus. And he thought that was so cute and so much fun. And Susie the bear never got much publicity. We're talking about like an actual bear, right? Bear, a real bear. <laughs> Where'd he get it? Where'd he get Susie the bear Piece from? Piece of shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the mysteries. <laughs> Well, we were at Thunder Road yesterday and walking around the facility. I still can't believe you built that at 25 years old. How much of a task was it? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Really? But it was, it was a chore because it hadn't been done before around here. Yeah. And that's what we wanted was something that was different. And... We got lucky in the fact that we thought so much about Barry, Vermont, granite capital of the world, and that has its own pride and everything. And we got to build this better than, better than better. Came out pretty good. It did. It did. It's a beautiful facility. Fantastic backdrop. How'd you find a location that was right for a racetrack like that? We worked on that. Yeah. Yeah, those hills just fit in perfectly. And we built the grandstand, the original wooden grandstand was, was deceased and got into concrete. But all of that was of a plan. And uh, you, could go there, you could go there to see the sunset or you could oh. go there to see a race. <laughs> yeah, or both, possibly. Or both, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you get both. <laughs> Sometimes you get a lot of rain. <laughs> Yeah, you got to keep the fans happy, keep the rain out of there. Um, your your daughter, Ashley, was telling me about some of the events that go on at the track. I think the last race coming up shortly, and they got porta potty racing. What is that? Is that something you came up with? I hate to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody races something. That's right. Yeah. And uh, we had a sponsor. And... Uh, that goes on every year. And uh, the different race divisions, they create their porta potty for the year. And it shows up at the track. And there's an unveiling. And uh, there's the golden plunger <laughs> for that award. And then for the contribution of the best race, and they line them up side by side. Yeah, history making. <laughs> Quite the event, yeah. That's yeah. the that's the next level stuff that we're that's we're right. Talk it's, about it's it's above above everything around us. No, <laughs> no one has ever seen anything like that. No, yeah. there's you know Daytona 500 history. There's NASCAR championships, but I think the porta potty racing might take might take the top top of the and podium. Thunder Road produced good races. Yeah, but it had a feel to it that was kind of local, and people loved it. The the local crowd that you touched on. I think is is something that I've picked up on in my short time here in Vermont. How would you describe the racing community that's here? Passionate. Yeah. And you had to really think about it because at one time the opportunity was for Burlington, Vermont, only you, yeah. but very fit. From the beginning, stock car racing to a great degree emphasized agricultural racing. All those guys that came out of Indianapolis originally, there were some special guys, you know, always. But it had the feeling of where it was. And Barry, Vermont, what they produce are monuments, memorials, and, and buildings. Many of the buildings in 
Washington, D.C. come from Barry Granite. It's good stuff. And they are. And they're very proud of it. So uh, it seemed the right place to be. And they were there and big, enthusiastic fans. Uh, their sports teams, they're always enthusiastic for whatever they played and however they finished. It was the right town for that sport. Racing is so special. And, and a lot of my memories are at the racetrack. You know, that's where my dad and I bonded the most. And um, it's where community comes together. And you've been able to be a part of that for most, if not all of your life. What does that community mean to you and, and for you to be in that for so long? Well, that happens wherever you get a short track that's successful because it does represent in some way the bonding of that community or communities. And Vermont is really a community, small state, but they had great pride and it was represented in what that track was. And it couldn't be anything less than it was. It could be more, but it couldn't be less. Racing seems like it's such an art form at times it's beautiful to watch and sometimes it's not you know but that sometimes that's the beauty of it is how it's imperfect how would you describe the art form of racing and what made you fall in love with it in the first place well from following the fairs and seeing the open cockpit cars and dreaming of what you could do to assimilate some of that into a local track and it worked out real good it did. Uh, I want to show you a clip. Uh, we're kind of jumping ahead here on the timeline. Um, this is of the 1979 Daytona 500. The last lap, an important one, you were on the call. And uh, maybe you can walk me through it after watching it. Down to this, out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. are out in the backstretch are the leaders watching for the leaders to they're still up in turns three and four the leaders are up in turns three and four coming down richard petty is now pulling out in front darrow waltrip is in second aj Boyd is in third here they come waltrip trying to slingshot petty is out in front at the line waltrip to the inside petty wins it let's look again at that crash here it is. They're in the end of the turn already, spinning, sliding. The hopes for Donnie Allison vanish. Cale Yarbrough trying to win his third. He's out of it. A sad moment for these people, but for Richard Petty, hurt all of last year, driving most of the year with a broken and battered body. He comes home a winner today after 45 straight losses. And, and there's a fight between Cale Yarbrough and Donnie Allison. The tempers overflowing they're angry they know they have lost and what a bitter defeat a couple of very hard men very hardly upset and bobby allison has stopped by so to watch that live <laughs> what's going through your head in that final final lap well to start that <laughs> on cbs <laughs> with what looked like a prepared finish. <laughs> How do you put together something and you bring Richard Petty home first, yeah. who was the representative to much of America, and still today, the Petty family. Get him in front. I know. And you've got that Daryl Waltrip right there, yeah. young guy, <laughs> looking good and really trying. But behind that was the whole Allison story which is a family out of Florida mm -hmm. originally, and they moved up to Alabama. And the Alabama gang was created out of what they were and are today. So all of that played a part in giving you a Americana kind of finish that you couldn't have expected nor anticipated as it came out. In fact, AJ was running fifth or sixth, below the front five. Yeah. 
And he called into his crew chief and said, where are we? And he told him that they were fifth or six. And he said, how much does that pay? <laughs> and the guy gave him a number and he said, okay. And he stayed there. A lot of people still think that A.J. Foyt could have won that race. And he was not willing to pull out and fool around with those guys. And you saw what happened to the two that were the eventual story of the race. That was, that was magic. Yeah. It was just magic. And it was the kind of thing that Bill France really understood. And there they were with an Indianapolis champion, you know. And it was fun to do, and it's always fun to see. And I'll tell you something. The race was over, and CBS had spent an outlandish amount of money to put that on. It was the first time and everything that could happen had happened. And uh, it had rained in the morning. We almost lost it that day. Huh. For two hours we waited. We got it in, got it over, and you have this lollapalooza of a finish, right? And then the principals in the story come back on stage for one more round, and they really got after each they other. Did. And probably for right for reasons. <laughs> But it made that story of that race, and that as much as the finish at the very first race, Daytona 500, was something that got in people's minds and they couldn't get rid of. It, you talk about a, a perfect finish, and, and that first Daytona 500 being the photo finish, great start for Big Bill, and now the first flag-to-flag -flag Daytona 500 finish ends like that. Are you thinking... This is this is great. This is going to help propel the sport into no. a new level. You weren't. No, I was trying to stay ahead of what was going on. <laughs> yeah. And what had happened was you had those top runners all together. And there was another car out there painted with the same colors yeah. as Richard Petty. Buddy Arrington? Buddy Arrington. Yeah. And uh, when they lost the principals down the backstretch and into the wall, the search was for the leader. Yeah. And they started to pick up this car running by itself, actually several laps down. And so some of that call was trying to be a spotter to tell them where the leader was. Yeah. Because he was still, that was still a tremendous battle among those cars. And uh, they got it right and they brought the right car against the line. But that, that was a moment, and uh, that's about all I thought about was, you know, you didn't want someone that wasn't a principal in it being involved as if he was. Nice guy, too. <laughs> I heard they were going to take the blimp camera down in turn three where the accident was, but... but yeah, yeah. And, and I had a partner who went down as a spotter and worked in the, in the uh, truck. And he realized what was going on. And he saw them searching. I mean, here you had five cars together running for first place at the end of 500 miles. Good enough when it was three in that first time that we really got to know about Daytona. And uh, we got to the right cars, but there was a shaky moment in that finish as they were coming around, turn into the backstretch behind the incident mm -hmm. that, that we were going to bring somebody across the line that wasn't in there. was still trying, but it was two or three laps down. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened in the first race where there were three of us coming to the line. But that's what made Daytona really work. That what we said that kind of racing could be was indeed what it was. Nothing more, nothing less. I think 15 million people or so tuned into the broadcast. There was a snowstorm up north that kept everyone inside their homes watching this race on television. But before the race, Big Bill blacked the race out in a lot of markets. How many people did you think were going to end up watching this race? And were you surprised by the number that it ended up being? We didn't have any idea. Yeah. 
But that, that business of he sold tickets, Bill France, and the idea that something could interfere with that was in his mind. And he did himself a favor and gave us this incredible finish. And certainly they were contenders, five strong, toward the end of the race, got down to the two, fighting for, the, and they had been at it earlier in the day. So uh, you just had to follow the dots. NASCAR gets propelled uh, and we enter the 1980 season and we're seeing new names, especially a name like Earnhardt it, taking the center stage in, in NASCAR history. What's your first impression of Dale Earnhardt? Well, in those days, Earnhardt's name did not mean what it is today. That was his dad, and he was a great racer, and all the other racers could tell you about him. Yeah. But it sort of stopped there. He was a short tracker and a damn good one. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't one that carried over as it did with A.J. Foyt, Indianapolis and all of that, and Richard Petty even then was a noted name in stock car racing with all those other southeastern runners. But it was the expansion of racing that was represented there as well. Incredible the impact NASCAR has on not just the sport itself, but America in general, as you mentioned. Um, I'll have to admit, I'm 21 years old. I never got to witness Petty racing at his prime, Earnhardt racing at his prime, these big names. What was the NASCAR garage like back then and, and what could we possibly, you know, be missing? Paint me a picture of, of what NASCAR was like in the 80s and 90s. Well, as far as racing was concerned, Bill France made it the number one item in people's minds. And he meant it, that it had to be number one. And all of a sudden, those guys came through. And for the most part, they were Southeastern because the agricultural part of racing, which is what it was, out of all those fairs and all that stuff, in the case of the Southeast, they made a product that they could identify with, which was outlaw. Yeah. That added to it. And there was nothing outlaw about the petties. Some others, <laughs> optional, and made it really great. So it had that spirit of America in it. I don't give a damn. I'm going to do this because I love it. And I may go to jail for a year and a day if I got caught running. But so be it. Do you still think we see that outlaw spirit today? Not as much. No, no, because it's a different time. And now those that were called outlaws in those days are greatly <laughs> respected as some of the best names in the business Yeah, because they took the risk. They, and they didn't have much else in their life to make up for that. It was a, a happening within the United States. And all of a sudden, Daytona had cars and good ones and strong names out of California. Mm. Came, and, and one of the very best in those days, Marvin Panch, nice guy, decent American, truly. And Marvin was as hard a racer as there was in the game. I'm, but the, all of them are up on the wheel. There wasn't any fancy foolishness among them. They knew what they had to get done. And if they didn't win, to hell with it. So they gave it all of that. And that's what you saw at Daytona. And that kind of spirit, sometimes unrecognized in a lot of sports because they get covered over with all the publicity and so forth. That, that meant everything. I mean, Cale Yarborough went to those races in the early days when he was first married. And he talks about going to some track in South Carolina. And they got up to pay a toll. And he and his wife didn't have enough money together to pay for the toll. And the guy let him go. And forever, because he then went out and won a race and it was part of what made Cayley Arboro. But they were right out of the American public 
and they looked that way and they weren't putting on any airs. They didn't go to any colleges nor universities, most of them. And they meant what they drove. They just totally believed in racing. And you can't beat it when you have that kind of feeling in it. And no one understood that because it was a stunt show for most of America because they crashed cars. And that was at the end of an era where stunt shows really ruled with a lot of America because that's what they could afford on all these fairs. Marvin Panch, when he won the Daytona 500, because he darn near got killed, and the Wood Brothers were asked to think about that. Made a big difference. You mentioned the stunt shows and um, the early days of racing cars at the the fairs. And, and a lot of your job was to sell racing and make it entertaining and, you know, uh, you know, over, over, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, it was just, uh, many times a super exaggeration. Exaggeration. That's the word I was looking but for. But it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it was real. People died. People cared that much. And they came back week after week, year after year, back with awful injuries. But they did it because it was their opportunity to shine at something and something they could do well and a lot of people didn't want to do. Do you think racing is in the entertainment business? Of course it is. Yeah, it is. So is the NBA and baseball and all of that. But there was a real reality in watching those stock car drivers and particularly at that time. And you couldn't find a better representative than a Petty or Arboro or the Alabama gang, all of whom gave everything they could to win. And there was no nonsense about people paying them and all that sort of thing. They earned their own way. And they, as much as anything, turned America on to what they really were, which was the spirit of America. How do you go about selling racing to the heart of America? Would, like, take me through your job of trying to, to sell that to, to people who might not understand racing at the time. You sell the people. It's always the people. It's different now, and it's going to be different in the future because we've got another level of racers, and they're beautiful, great kids. But the, many of them didn't come through the wars that the predecessors did. And in their case, you either won or you went home with nothing. And there was not much you could do about that because there was so much desire to do it. You could take a piece of metal and turn it into a race car. That wasn't the case with Indy. It wasn't the case with sports cars. It wasn't the case of most anything. This was a home brew, and it was a darn good one. And the people loved it. America. They understood it. And they understood those people because they were their neighbors. So you told their stories. The story of Kaylee Arborough. I mean, you couldn't find a better story to tell than Kaylee Arborough, <laughs> who, according to his mother, jumped off the porch one day and landed on a rattle rattlesnake. <laughs> Snake died. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and... Uh, and then he had a bear, Susie the bear. Okay, yeah. And, and of course, he was a stuntman of his own making. He would do things to make money, jump out of airplanes, parachuting with a parachute <laughs> in his arms or in a Crisco can. And as he came down, and get the thing opened up and land. But one time he was hired by a community in north of South Carolina to jump at their special event. It worked beautifully, except he landed five miles from where the event was. Oh no. Yeah. That's a, that's And that walk. was Kaylee Arborough. Susie was a real bear. And he got the greatest delight. Uh, he loved animals. 
And all of his life, he's loved animals as much as his girls. And uh, <laughs> so Susie the bear got taken for rides in the airplane. And he got caught. <laughs> and of course, you know, I don't know where he landed, but it was an airport large enough. And they had people there that understood that you didn't take animals and put them in the co-pilot seat yeah. and fly with them. <laughs> didn't bother him any. Susie liked to fly. And uh, so that lasted a while. And Susie got too big. So he got, she got eliminated from that. She got <laughs> taken out of the air. But he was content with that. And, and that spirit, that's a different attitude than most people have yeah. with a bear. Yeah. Susie. But that was the spirit of that whole period of time. And uh, Kale was also an expert on snakes. <laughs> and he was apt to bring them to the pit area. And some of those drivers did not appreciate that. In the pit. And were chased out of the, he was chased around in the pit area <laughs> because they, they had those imitation snakes. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of that, but there were some. So he brought his own. <laughs> Didn't go well at all. I don't think Didn't that would go well. go well at all. But <laughs> it was fun to him, and, and it was something he understood and got along with. And he's still alive. <laughs> I think the story here is there's no containing Kelly Yarborough. There was no contain. <laughs> <laughs> His mother once said on CBS, Yeah. Why do you do it? Why do you do it? And there was no answer that could explain why he did it, but he liked to do it. And if it hurt anybody, he kind of considered it was going to hurt him. But I don't think he considered that either. That was just part of what he was. And it was that spirit that you couldn't capture many places. That was Daniel Boone back in the stock car. And when he won Daytona, when he won all those races, and to me, Kelly Arborough represented so much of the spirit that was in that sport. And he had a wonderful wife who put up with him. And uh, one time he was, he was working for Holman Moody and they were living on the edge. And there was a sale on uh, groceries and the sale featured boxes of one was several boxes of peas. Kale said, we lived on peas, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for about a season uh, because we could afford it. It was healthy. <laughs> and the kids didn't have any problem with it. And that is the kind of spirit where you're willing to give up so much for what you thought was represented in the sport. And uh, he was right. I think race car drivers, you have to be half crazy to get in these race cars back then, today. We talk about race car drivers being daredevils. Do you think you gotta be crazy to jump into these race cars? No. No? No. You, there was a whole part of that society that didn't have much of a chance at anything. And here was something that they could manufacture themselves, build mm. it in the backyard and take it to the track and make it work. Those Wood Brothers, they, they made it work for themselves. And guess what they did besides race? One or two of those brothers grew flowers and loved them. And one of them retired, was not on the team anymore because he cared so much about flowers. Mm. Nobody ever knew about that. Yeah. But he had that feeling for the land and the people and the place. And then he went out with his brothers. And the first one they built, first car, burned up on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> and it burned up on the neighbor's lawn or something like that. They were not particularly t pleased. Yeah. They were displeased with the conduct. I would think a car car burning up is never a good thing. <laughs> uh, I want to jump ahead um, to you starting MRN. How did that come about? Bill France. Yep. 
he realized that what he needed was a story he had to tell. He needed something like a religion. And religions on Sunday morning, particularly in the South, they, they could tell a story and they could get on the radio, they'd tell it like the Dickens. Mm -hmm. And how was he going to do that? Radio. And he totally believed in it. The first Daytona 500, CBS did. And it was a replay kind of thing. And they brought their best announcer down. And he wasn't of the mold. <laughs> And he was good. I mean, he's one of the best in television history, Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Bill was not impressed one bit. He wanted the real folks. And so after a while, he took the Daytona 500 out of the mix. And there were several, not, not several, two or three racing networks. Because for radio, it was magic. Had a microphone and a way to get it on the air, you were in business. But you could paint these pictures and you could paint the pictures in a manner that sometimes might have overemphasized things that weren't really what they were, but they were when you saw them whizzing by and you could make something of it that people cared about. Winning the American way and American cars and France, bore into that and he drove it like the Dickens. And we built that motor racing network in no time. We had three or 400 races across the country. California was with the break-in because the Southeast, that was recognized. Every radio station that was trying to get people wanted those races. Other parts of the, well, even in New England, it wasn't that popular. But he had the product and how was he gonna get it out and communicate what this was, radio. What did your first office at MRN look like? <laughs> Bill gave Roger Beer, he was a fellow from uh, up in Minnesota, I think, our own office in the hallway, <laughs> right next to his office where he could keep track of things. <laughs> and we were supposed to clear markets across the country. So we'd go in in the morning early and we'd work till nine o'clock at night because that, you could still talk to the California folks till nine o'clock at night and, and get people in stations that we could make decisions and try to sell this image of what Bill France saw. And that became the Motor Racing Network. Does it count as an office if it's in the hallway? It was in the hallway. <laughs> oh, it was a beautiful office with a table <laughs> and a Coca-Cola machine. Was it? Was it? Was it Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, yeah. Yeah, Coca-Cola with a top that would slide back and forth. <laughs> and that was the office for the original Motor Racing Network. But it was right next to Bill Francis' office, which told you he was really keeping, keeping track of it because he understood the importance of, and the consequence of selling America on that this is as good as what you have which was what? Baseball was, was easy to do. This was more difficult. And so it kept a lot of people away. And in the Southeast, there were guys that came out and started those networks. And Darlington had their own. Charlotte had their own. And it was there. But then how do you get across to the others that, that it's, it's what we say it is? Mm -hmm. So some of us who probably were probably prone to exaggeration, <laughs> were experts <laughs> represented for him because, and it wasn't in any need of exaggeration, but it just needed people to paint the picture of what it was. And radio served so well and, and still does to get that image across. And you could be driving anywhere on a Sunday afternoon in the South and you could hear a race. You're in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and for decades, people tuned in to the TV to hear your voice call these unbelievable moments throughout the years. What does it mean to be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame? A lot, because it was a representation that I 
was onto something and be- believed in it enough, believed in it enough yeah. that we could sell it. And you can't sell anything if you don't believe in it. It was that simple. And France recognized that and just surrounded himself with people that felt the same way. And you could do a lot of bad things, perhaps, but you had to believe in what this was. The true believers really made the difference. You were a true believer from the very start. You you believed before a lot of other people did. When people say the name Ken Squire today, what do you what do you hope that they think of and, and what do you think your legacy on the sport is? Oh, I never thought about that very much. I thought I was doing what I loved and what I knew something about. And there's a lot of things I didn't know very much about. One was baseball. But this was a sport that represented so much of the United States. And then those cars, big, bulky, difficult to handle cars, speeding it. (laughs) The speed of sound, you know, all that kind of thing. Hey, and it made a lot of noise. (laughs) And when those kids came back from World War II, there was a whole new influx of those people. And they were good people. And they turned the tide in favor of it. And it took a long time for the major markets to understood that because they, those were television markets like CBS, like NBC, like ABC. Uh, I mean, guys running around in circles, making a lot of noise. What the hell did that mean? Well, it meant that someone was sitting in that car that cared enough about it that he was going to run it until the wheels came off or he won. No ifs, ands, or buts. Excuse me. But it was that was the part of it, that we could take an American product, the motor car, and that would be the passenger car, not the sporty cars. And we could make something of it. And Bill France did that. He understood completely why the new car. And when that came into play in NASCAR, the new cars, that's when NASCAR just elevated itself to a new delivery, to the point where they were talking to, they were talking to Detroit, and Detroit was listening, and they learned some things that were manufactured, produced, thought out. <laughs> in Spartanburg and all throughout the South. One thing I've always loved about watching your races is your vocabulary, the squireisms, as uh, many people call it. We spoke with Dave Moody about what his favorite of your, you know, many, many phrases and squireisms were. And uh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you see what he said. Every Friday I would be in his office and we'd go through all of the things that I did wrong and the one or two things that I almost did right. Because, you know, Ken's no glad hander. He's going to give you the the brutal truth whether you're ready for it or not. And uh, so, and when we were done at the end of our sessions, he would say, okay, go home and Thursday night come back to the track with a list of 20 ways to say side by side. And so I'd go home and I'd, you know, uh, door to door, bumper to bumper, wheel to wheel, nose to nose, whatever. And I'd come back with my list and he'd say, and he'd look at it and say, yeah, okay, now use all of those tonight. Don't say the same thing the same way because people don't want to hear that. That was his number one phrase. People don't want to hear that. Do it the right way. People don't want to hear that. And then the next week it would be 20 ways to say nose to tail, 20 ways to say on the outside, 20 ways to say on the inside. And after a while, that just starts ingraining itself in your brain and you start kind of self-monitoring yourself as you're on the microphone and you say, all right, I said it that way twice, now it's time to say it a different way. And that never happens without (laughs) Ken. Or you don't say anything. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of times it speaks for itself, the action. And that they're running that close together. You can just say that's what's going on. And it was true. And it was the kind of racing that America wasn't used to. 
because those guys played for real. <laughs> and there was a lot of guys that went through the fence. Ralph Earnhardt, he was a tough driver. And uh, he put other people through the fence, which you couldn't say exactly is in that way. But he was tough. And he meant to win. And winning meant everything. Because second place didn't pay that much. And many tracks had hardly paid. And he was somewhat successful, no question. But he had an, an air about him that was kind of unique and special. And there were others, too, at that same time who got it, who understood that they were playing with something that was bigger than they were, and they could control it. Control it. And control is all, always a story. How do you control it? And then describe it. Yeah, Ralph Earnhardt was one of a kind. He had a tangle with Ned Jarrett. Yeah. Ned Jarrett. Yeah. And mm -hmm. th there were occasions when he was coming along, and he was a bright guy. He got the he got the taste of this thing and understood it. And he was a good driver. And today is still a good representative of what the sport is. And deservedly so that he gets some credit. Because he came from a slightly different attitude about racing. But it was just as passionate and just as real and fair as any of the others. And uh, he talked about going back home one night after a pretty savage race and he had part of the Earnhardt family with him and they were all in the same car. It was very quiet going home mm -hmm. because Ralph had put Jared around a tree. and uh, But that was part of what the game was. And you had to not only be very big about it, but able to forget it and go back and do it again. That's hard to say, but it's true. And we saw it on all the short tracks because they got out there and when it got down to deciding things, they decided it in their own way, which was the American way. And I always thought it defined or redefined what the United States of America meant in World War II in Europe and then in the Pacific. That was their attitude. May not be able to talk about it much, but we got it done. When these big moments happen on the track, you said you could just say nothing, let it speak for itself, or sometimes words are, are the way to go. Where did you come up with your extensive vocabulary? I lied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> Tried to tell the story as best I could. But here was something in front of you that was being lived at this very fast pace, which in the case of NASCAR and they got under the bigger tracks was so serious. And when something bad happened, it was bad, period, end of statement. And to represent as much as you could that without making it death dodgers uh, was important because that's what they were and still are today. I have a clip from David Hobbs, uh, your broadcast partner of many years. And uh, you guys are in the booth at Talladega one year and he's told this story a few times. Um, I'll let him tell it and you can tell me what you think. Ken and I are standing up right up against the wall because we can't go back far enough. And of course the light's all wrong because the floodlights are on us and they're bouncing back from the windows of the booth. And we're standing there, and we're all, all of Ken used to look at the lights and blink like go like that. So that he didn't squint when he's looking at the camera, he'd go like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and anyway, we got about a minute, less than a minute to go, and Ken sneezed <laughs> and snuck all ran down his tie. And Diane Patterson, it was a, she said, you ass. And she, 
she grabbed, she found some tissue from somewhere and she gets wiping down his tire. You know, with meanwhile, it's like 25, you know, 15, it's clean, straight his tire. And then just we went on because all this was live. I mean, we never did any, all those recording days had gone. Everything, everything was live from then on. But yeah, about 45 seconds ago, you see, ah, fall down his shirt and tire. <laughs> That was that was a fun. That was a, that was a good memory. Do you remember that? It was an allergy. It was. <laughs> yeah, it certainly was. And as you hear today, I still have it. <laughs> One of those things that comes along, and you have to deal with it as it is. Sometimes it comes to the precarious place, like a start of a race. Yeah. Bad. But did anyone know? Nobody knew. No, nobody knew. Yeah. Well, that was because of Diane Peter, Diane Keo Patterson. And uh, she looked after us in the booth. It takes a lot of people to put on a race. What was your broadcast crew like working with and, and how'd you like your team? Well, they changed a lot. Uh, the first one was Marvin Panch. The first races we did, I did, with an expert was Marvin Panch, who to this day I think so much of and what he meant. This was a guy out of California, and he definitely was a racer. No question about it. Damn near killed himself. And when he got so badly hurt, he went to the Wood Brothers because he was scheduled to run in the Daytona 500 and said, I want that guy that got that car off of me. And then there was a birdcage down at Maserati, and he would got it upside down practicing at Daytona. And uh, he was going to make it, but uh, it was 50-50. <laughs> and uh, he was back and just as interested and as interested in racing as before that incident. And he was able to confide to people what it was that he did in a manner that they appreciated. Guys like that, you just can't. Ned Jarrett is certainly one of those. Uh, he was better schooled than many, but he took that schooling to school, and he used everything he could find to explain, explain, to communicate with people what it was that the sport was. And it made a big difference to have those people at that time, because they spoke from experience and tough experience as to what racing was. And it made such a difference. You mentioned Ned Jarrett. He he worked in the booth with you for a number of years. You actually let him take the call to call Dale Jarrett home to the Daytona 500. What was it like taking the back seat on that one? Well, it was necessary. That was his kid. Yeah. And his kid had drove a hell of a race. And uh, it was right for him to bring his son home. He did a good job. <laughs> Is there a particular race, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, over over all the years that stands out as being one that was unbelievable to watch in person? Most of them. <laughs> because you had it in front of you, and what were you going to do? And there were some hellish scenes, and some miracle scenes, and some sad scenes. But that is the way of America. And you couldn't hide it. There it was, on fire, in smoke. And that kind of spirit in America, that's hard to define and hard to put into place in the midst of a sporting event. But that's what that was. And time after time, we get into those situations. And Ned Jarrett was just wonderful. He, he saw it in his interpretation from one who darn near was killed. He didn't have to say it, but in his explanation of what he was looking at, it all came across and people understood this is more than throwing a ball and catching it. We talk about daredevils and people willing to put their lives on the line to achieve something that not many people have done before. 
I know you were at Edwards Air Force Base in 1979, and I'll pull up a clip for you um, of the land speed record. I'll, I'll let you watch this, and you can tell me what you think. If the beaches of Daytona and Ormond are the birthplace of speed, then here at Rogers Dry Lake at Edwards Air Force Base, this is the birthplace of supersonic speed. And for the first time, a man is attempting to go supersonic in a land vehicle. Stan Barrett attempting the effort here. He is about to get in the automobile to try for that magic mark here on land better than 740 miles per hour. Problem or not, he is underway. That's amazing. 714 miles an hour for Stan Barrett. Do you remember seeing that speed in person? Sure do. What was that like? That run was something that Hal Needham made up. He was an interesting character <laughs> and smart. He had all kinds of great ideas. We were in Tonopah, Nevada with that rocket car. And that was... Needham, who made all those movies that were kind of fun. But this was serious stuff. And uh, he said he was going to get a rocket car over the record for land speed. And we had tried so hard originally in Utah. And there was a problem they had pulled so much salt off the salt flat and it wouldn't, the wheels would not catch. It went through and into the dirt and it would throw that tripod well in front, the two behind them, up in the air at 700 miles an hour and you were floating down through and it settled back down. And that was Stan Barrett. And, and he came out of a family that had a lot to do with skiing out west. He wasn't a big skier, but he understood something about risk. And it was there that uh, Hal Needham came up with some other ideas and we listened and said, you, know, you can't do that. <laughs> and, uh, and he became a good friend. He had learned all that he did and he was a top stuntman for many, many years. So you know, stuntmen and racing don't naturally fit together but he understood what it was to hang it all on yourself at high speed. So I paid very careful attention to what he told me. And uh, it, it developed into that story about the rocket car. And they had taken it up to 700 miles an hour. Interesting people. <laughs> yeah and people that really care about racing and are willing to put all that you think about is important in life off to the side and just go do it. He was a big listen and he did that and he became famous in Hollywood for the stunts that he would attempt that nobody would even consider trying to do. Interesting. And that character was represented by Bert in those movies that they made together. It was beyond people's imagination. And he p played on that and made movies about it. He's quite a guy. Yeah, they got the thing up, it was what, a, a little under 700 miles what? an hour. And it, the, the, the rocket car just wouldn't go the extra mile. So somebody said to him, you know, what you need, you got to get more because you can't get past this. This was the level you could, with what they had. But he said, you know what would do it? And this was General Jaeger who got involved <laughs> because it was a speed record and he was, he was a hell of a pilot in World War II. He said, you know, you need a Sidewinder missile and put it in the car. And when you get to that last, you can, get over the top. <laughs> oh, sure, right. <laughs> so the general went to work and Hal ended up with one or two Sidewinder missiles and we took them out there and it went up over 700 miles an hour. Wow. 
the driver of that, Stan Burr, yeah. was a nice guy with a nice family. But he got to be a believer. And he was he could have been a minister as much as anything. He was a true believer. And I find more and more of that feeling in the guys that were the stock car drivers, where they would go beyond where everybody had been and take the chances. And some of them were successful and some of them not so successful. But that kind of spirit sometimes gets left out of things. And that's a part of it that I think is of interest to everyone. What kind of person would do that? Not too many. What shocks me about the interview you had with Stan Barrett is he went 714 miles an hour. Yeah. But all he could think about was how he could go faster. Yeah. <laughs> and he was a stuntman trained by Hal Needham. He understood about that stuff. Yeah. Exaggeration. Well, it was up there where they could measure with the equipment how fast the thing was going. So they were really hung out on that. And I think we made three different efforts out there. And they got over 700 miles, 714, and the record was higher than that. And they believe they did it. But I'll tell you, by the time they got to the end of that one, you thought you were at the end of everything because he was a regular guy who thought he was going to be a minister at one time and uh, stand there. Crazy people, <laughs> good people, Americans. Yeah. Is it true that you told Hal Needham when he was thinking of making Smoking the Bandit that it wasn't a good idea? Oh, awful. <laughs> We'd go out there to the salt flats. And he always had another chapter to add to this, what he thought would make the great movie. And <laughs> finally, over a few toddies, he told me how this was going to work. And I said, Hal, this is the dumbest thing you've ever thought of. <laughs> Why do you want to do that? He says, well, I know I can do it. They came right out there and did it. Made every effort. And that was so much of the character that was represented in his buddy, Bert. Uh, yeah, those were great days. And it was another experiment in breaking the barriers, breaking the line and doing it above and beyond where it ever been before. There are good people to learn from. And he was a good, what they would call a, a B director in motion pictures at Universal. <sighs> wow. We sure had fun. <laughs> I want to I want to close on this, um, just kind of bringing it back to racing in general, and so much that I've learned about you is you've lived here in Vermont all your life. You've always been close to family. You always came back home. What what's it like to have family kind of go through the racing world with you? Well, I was fortunate. I mean, I'm blessed. Uh, my father was a kid that grew up with no father, who went off to war in World War I and never came back. Because when he came back, he went looking for gold or something up in Alaska and was never seen again. But it was that kind of spirit that was so much of America. And I always take, take heed of that and respect the fact that this is the country where you could put your dreams into a place where you thought you could accomplish them. And if you didn't, sometimes you died. That's a whole different attitude than we have about many things. And so many of those stars, they, they wouldn't define it as that. You could talk to Ned Jarrett about things like that because he hung it over the edge all the time when he drove. 
and yet he was such a conscientious and good person. And everybody always liked to do the hell driver, daredevil thing. He was a pretty regular guy. And he just was so fascinated with what you could do with a great big bulky, <laughs> looking like a bread box car and make it go fast. Terrific story. And he believed it. And he did it. I mean, he won races and more races and more races. And he had some awful explosions, awful explosions into stuff that he was lucky to get out of. But if you're going to go that far and go that distance, you have to accept that that's part of the risk. And today it's the same. I don't think these kids today have any idea of that because they train on machinery that can put them into that position without having to physically do it. But don't think for a moment that those that actually get it done and will continue to get it done are just good Yankees. <laughs> oh, I can't say that, can I? Because that leaves out the South. And so many of them were from the land of John Ned Jarrett. I hear you still watch watch most every race today? N not most. Most? Some. Some? I would try to watch all the cup races. And I always like the coming uppers, the Saturday show. Because yeah. you see some guys in there and you know they're scared to death. <laughs> and they still get it together and perform on a level that is like the high wire act in the circus. And that's part of it. That's part of racing, and it's part of what makes it special. You enjoy watching the racing today? Yes. Oh, sure. No question. That today they have so much more education, so much more knowledge, so much more to work with, and now they've got big money that are backing them. But it always comes down to the guy that puts his seat in the car and goes fast. You can't fight with that. That's the, the reality of what they do. That's a good thing for the United States because we get caught up in a lot of sports where you hit the ball and hit it back. <laughs> uh -uh. I want to find the guys that are willing to hit the ball right out of the park. <laughs> do you still see those guys in the drivers today? Those daredevils? I don't know that I see as much and probably that's a good thing. Yeah. That's the, But when you get to that top line, the fastest and the best, which was what NASCAR and Indianapolis, I don't want to discredit that. Mm -hmm. Those guys are amazing. But that's that American spirit, American character, which is motor racing more than many other places. <laughs> I like how you use the word high wire act like that's a great way to describe well, racing it was a, always a, you know the guy that jumped off and <laughs> down and hoped he hit them matt special characters and meaningful and you got to take that out of it and understand that the the reason that hal needham took the chance on stan barrett took the mm -hmm. the reason that he took that risk was because he thought in his mind that he was going to become a minister. And he wanted a platform to work from that meant something. That got lost in translation as it went along and he went faster and faster. But he thought that. And he was a great runner, foot runner. And he ran every day that I knew him, still know him. Good fellow character and i think that's part of it when you say character you always think of boys guys and so forth but the characters in racing represented so much more and when you take them out and you sit them down and you interview them you can find that and that's what i think america is always looking for escaping to find out of our day-to-day -day existence and we've got some kids coming along now that are, and there's more because now they've put the race car into a form of training 
where you can go that fast without going that fast. But there comes a time when you have to give all that up and go out there and show the show. I've always looked up to you as someone that I've tried to shape myself as, as an up and comer in the, in the racing industry. What advice would you have for me and, and what challenges might I face as I progress in my career? Well, first of all, you need to move to Vermont. <laughs> step one. <laughs> yeah, that's step one. But to be true to yourself and what you believe in, most people are playing the game created by television, broadcasting, media. But the real people are the ones that we focus on and have to because they go out and do it. How many races a year? That's pretty special. And that special gets lost in all of the advertising and all the promotion. But somewhere in the kid that really believes in this game, and they have to believe awfully hard because they pay some big dues. That makes them special. For years, racing's been full of heroes, and I think everyone would define you as a hero of racing, and, and so much of what we see now is you help pave the way for that. And so I appreciate you letting us into your home, Ken, and um, being able to chat with you these couple of days and to, to see this place that you've grown up around and that you've put so much of your time and effort in. It's been really cool for me. So um, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. Vermont's a good place to be from. It's not a rich state as far as pecuniary means, but as far as a place that really has some feeling to it and people that are real, you can't beat Vermont. I love it and I love the people. And I guess everybody feels that way about where they're from, but I really feel it here. It means so much. And all I am is a talker, <laughs> which lets me know what I really am. And I was awful glad to talk to you. Awesome. That's great. Great awesome. advice too. Ken, they, can we get a picture? Oh yeah, definitely. I, no, that, that costs extra. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta come back. <laughs> you've, got to learn, you've got to learn the business. Right? <laughs>